So it's Roundup herbicide that's specially formulated for big jobs. That's the new one. On oh, this one, it says biodegradable. That's the old one. It doesn't say biodegradable anymore, so it must no longer be biodegradable. It's the same product. I imagine they don't have the right to say it anymore. It must not really be biodegradable. Be careful not to spray it in my face. Oh, I'm not a murderer. Well, I'm sure these Roundup Ready soybeans are ready to harvest today. They're probably about... I'm going to say about 11 and a half percent moisture, so they're perfect for harvest. First heard about Roundup Ready soybeans in a farm magazine about eight years ago, and uh, it seemed like a neat in innovation. The soybean has a protein genetically inserted into the plant, and it's resistance of Roundup. The Roundup is sprayed on the plants there are some definite advantages. If you look at our, my field here, you don't see weeds. When label directions are carefully followed, Roundup is not harmful to humans, animals, or their environment. Copyright Monsanto, made in Belgium. If you see any snails, don't spray them because they'll be inedible. To watch the strawberries. I'd encourage European farmers to take a look at the Roundup Ready technology. Frankly, it's very good for the environment. It's a sustainable system. So give it a try. Monsanto. For 20 years I've traveled the globe and everywhere I've heard about this American multinational. But what I've heard hasn't always been positive. Wanting to know more, I surfed the web for months to put the pieces of the puzzle together. On its website, Monsanto positions itself as an agricultural company that aims to help farmers produce healthier food while reducing agriculture's impact on our environment. Its leading product is Roundup, the world's best-selling herbicide for the last 30 years. One shot. All it takes for weeds. Roundup. Monsanto is also the world leader in biotechnology. 90% of the GMOs grown on the planet belong to them. Most of them have been genetically modified to resist the application of Roundup, like Roundup Ready soybeans. Monsanto's GMOs have invaded the planet, but no ag industry product in history has ever incited as much controversy and passion. Why? What's at stake with GMOs? And could the company's past shed some light on what the company is or claims to be today? Founded in St. Louis, Missouri in 1901, it was not always an agricultural company. It was one of the largest chemical companies of the 20th century. Chemistry is working for you, and very likely Monsanto is working for you. Monsanto, where creative chemistry works wonders for you. The wonders boasted about in this commercial made Monsanto one of the most controversial companies in the industrial era. Agent Orange, Aspartame, 
bovine growth hormone, PCBs. These chemically created oils used worldwide as coolants and lubricants in electrical equipment were the jewels in Monsanto's crown for over 50 years. They were called Aracloor in the United States, Pyrilin in France, and Clofen in Germany, until they were banned in the early 1980s. Monsanto PCB. A Washington Post article from 2002. Monsanto hid decades of pollution. It happened in Anniston, Alabama. Terry was my baby brother. Um, he died in 1971. Uh, from a cancer of the brains, or a tumor of the brains, cancer of the lungs, and hurries of the heart. He was 16. In the last three years, I have lost more friends. Uh, they died from illnesses, cancer, um, sugar diabetes, uh, hepatitis, all these different ailments that comes with PCBs, and they have been related to PCB. This is Monsanto Road. This is all just a black area of uh, minorities that live in this area. But every one of these homes was, like, contaminated. They just cleaned that yard up over there to the right about six months ago. These was all homes. These people lived here, and they now, they had to move. They, I mean, the houses was torn down. My brother fell dead right around the house. This is the house I was raised in. See this grass right here, they buried PCBs over here. Monsanto got permission to bury PCBs in Anniston. And uh, this is Snow Creek right here, where they put the cement in here. He comes from the plant discharging to PCBs all the way down through here. And it was poisoning. Uh, they never told anybody, but they told the state. The state didn't tell us. PCB Monsanto knew, but what exactly did they know? An environmental organization in Washington, D.C., headed by Ken Cook, has put internal Monsanto files online. Most of them are classified confidential. FYI and destroy. Nineteen thirty seven, exposure to PCBs provokes systemic toxic effects and acne form skin eruption. In nineteen sixty one, two workers developed hepatitis symptoms after a pipe broke in a factory using PCBs. In nineteen sixty six, Monsanto scientists placed fish in Snow Creek's water. All were dead in three and a half minutes. Pollution, a letter addressed to sales executives in 1970. This is the one that really tells you the story. They're saying, we can't afford to lose one dollar of business. Their neighbors in Anniston were not told about the, the poisoning that they were inflicting upon them because they didn't want to lose one dollar. It was only when lawyers went to court on behalf of people in Anniston and forced the company through the legal system to disclose these internal secret documents that we knew what they knew. They knew the truth from the very beginning. They lied about it. They hid the truth from their neighbors. They hid the truth, in many cases, from the government authorities. And when they did share information with government authorities that should have been acted upon, the government of authorities, instead of siding with the people who were being poisoned, sided with the company. They sided with Monsanto. It was outrageous, absolutely unforgivable. <laughs> oh, these are all your medicines? Yeah. Well, no, they ain't all of it. I, I got know. some more here. <laughs> 
How much you have in you? 63.8. In the blood. In the blood. If they took a fatty biopsy of him now, he probably would top the scales of about three or 4,000 parts per billion or more. And which is a level acceptable? I mean... Acceptable is two point part, uh, two part per billion. That's the standard all around the world. But these people, we have more in our bloods and in our body than actually anywhere else in the world. Uh -huh. It's usual here to speak about his PCB point. level. We all talk about it because it became a household word now. Kids used to run up to me, Mr. Baker, I, I got tested. I had three point part per billion in my blood. Uh, how, how long do you think I got? But that's a horrible story. But what do scientists think about it? On the web, you can find numerous articles concerning the effects of PCBs on human health. David Carpenter is one of the most qualified specialists in the field. He carried out the testing for the Aniston residents. We all have PCBs in our bodies. The polar bears and the penguins have PCBs. And what has happened is in the past, there were a few sites where PCBs were released, but over time they've gone into the air, they've gone into the water, they've transported, so the whole world is now contaminated with PCBs. The issue is that many diseases are caused by PCB exposure. The one everyone knows about is cancer. <laughs> My test results stated that I had 202, 202 parts per billion in my system. Women that get pregnant and have PCBs in their body will have a child with a reduced IQ. 29.6. PCBs cause reduced thyroid function. Oh, 1,800. PCBs interfere with sex hormones. I said, well, just let me pass away. Pass away in peace. He's going to pay. I said then, he's going to pay for the way that he has done to us. In 2001, 20,000 Aniston residents filed two lawsuits against Monsanto. Monsanto and its subsidiary, Solutia, settled by paying $700 million to compensate the victims, to clean up the site, and to build a specialized hospital. But no Monsanto executive was ever sued. To do justice. Under American law, in most instances, it's very rare for executives or uh, officials in these companies to be held criminally responsible. So we have the civil system, the civil courts. We make them pay. And the truth of the matter is, in most instances, uh, the price these companies pay decades later is a fraction of their profits. And this is why it pays to keep these problems secret. And it makes you wonder what they might be keeping secret now. Uh, I have to say, we would never trust a company like Monsanto to tell the truth about a pollution problem or about a product. We would never trust them. Ken Cook says we would never trust a company like Monsanto. So what about Roundup, the world's favorite herbicide used by gardeners and farmers alike? What is it exactly? It's the brand name Monsanto gave to glyphosate, a so-called non-selective or total herbicide because it destroys all plants. First sold in 1974, it owes its great success to Monsanto's unwavering claims that it is biodegradable and good for the environment. Voici Roundup, le premier désherbant biodégradable. Il détruit les mauvaises herbes de l'intérieur jusqu'aux racines et ne pollue ni la terre ni l'os de Rex. Roundup, le désherbant qui donne envie de désherber. Roundup biodegradable. Ken Cook was right. The company was found guilty of false advertising, twice. The first time was in New York in 1996. And the second was in France just last year. The judges found that the wording biodegradable leaves the soil clean and respects the environment were false advertising especially since, according to tests performed by Monsanto itself, 
Only 2% of the product had broken down after 28 days. That's why Monsanto recently removed the word biodegradable from its containers. But that's not all. Many scientific studies have shown that Roundup is highly toxic. For example, Roundup provokes cell division dysfunction, a study by Professor Robert Bellet. Professor Bellet works for the National Center for Scientific Research and the Pierre and Marie Curie Institute in France. He has studied the effects of Roundup on fertilized sea urchin eggs. The big surprise was that Roundup has an effect on cell division. We saw very quickly that Roundup affected a key process in cell division. Not the cell division mechanisms themselves, but those which control cell division. You have to understand how cells become cancerous. In the beginning, all cells are benign, and then at a certain point, modifications take place in the cells that make them unstable from a genetic point of view. This is the first malfunction that we observed with Roundup. It is for that reason that we consider that Roundup provokes the first stages that lead to cancer. We're careful not to say it provokes cancer, because we won't see the cancers develop for 30 or 40 years. It was immediately clear how important these findings were for product users, especially since the tested doses were well below those which people normally use, and we said to ourselves, gosh, we really have to let the public know about the dangers as quickly as we can. And I thought the best way to do that was to talk to my administration. But there, I was shocked, and very, very shocked, because I was told, ordered, rather, not to communicate our findings due to the GMO question lurking in the background. What an incredible account. Roundup's toxicity was hidden to protect the development of GMOs. So let's go back to the creation of GMOs. According to Monsanto's site, Roundup Ready soybeans, introduced in 1996, were the first bioengineered crop to be approved in the United States. Farmers using these seeds belong to the American Soybean Association, whose address is on Monsanto's site. John Hoffman is its vice president and an ardent biotechnology advocate. In the spring, I will go out and, and spray one pass of Roundup to burn down the weeds that are growing in the early spring. And about uh, six or seven weeks later, I'll spray a second pass of Roundup. And that controls the weeds for the year. Before we had Roundup technology, this field would have had weeds. We would have had to walk through and pull the excess weeds by hand. It was labor intensive. So the Roundup Ready system saves me time and it saves me money. It seems Monsanto's new wonder has what it takes to entice farmers. But how does it work? How can the soybean plants survive being sprayed with Roundup? This is a soybean cell. The core of this cell contains its DNA in which the bean's genetic structure is encoded. In order to create its GMOs, Monsanto breaks the species barrier using a Roundup-resistant gene harvested from a bacterium. This gene is placed on microscopic particles of gold, which are fired into the soybean cells with a gene gun. The gene penetrates the DNA and creates a protein, making the plant resistant to Roundup. When the herbicide is sprayed on the crop, it kills all the weeds, leaving the soybean plants intact. One must admit that the process is an incredible technological feat. But these soybeans engineered to withstand such a powerful herbicide are destined for our dinner plates. They must have been thoroughly tested before being put on the market. Who was the Secretary of Agriculture at the time? Dan Glickman, Bill Clinton's Ag Secretary from 1995 to 2000. What I found in the early years I was involved in the regula regulation of biotechnology that 
there was a general feeling in agribusiness and inside our government in the U.S. that if you weren't marching lockstep forward in favor of rapid approvals of biotech products, rapid approvals of GMO crops, then somehow you were anti-science and, and anti-progress. Well, I think that, frankly, there were a lot of folks in industrial agriculture who didn't want as much analysis as probably we should have had because they had made a huge amount of investments in the product. I mean, I think that, and, and certainly when I became secretary, given the fact that I was in charge of the department regulating agriculture, I had a lot of pressure on me not to push the issue too far, so to speak. But I, I would say even when I opened my mouth in the Clinton administration, I got slapped around a little bit by not only the industry, but also some of the people even in the administration. In fact, I made a speech once uh, where uh, saying that we needed to be more, we needed to more thoughtfully think through the regulatory issues on GMOs. And I had some people within the Clinton administration, particularly on, in the U.S. trade area, that were very upset with me. They said, how could you in agriculture be questioning our regulatory regime? In a nutshell, in the United States, the Secretary of Agriculture doesn't stand a chance against the multinationals. But just how are GMOs regulated in the United States? The most crucial policy on the subject was published by the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, which is legally responsible for regulating the safety of food and medicine. Title, Foods Derived from New Plant Varieties. Date, May 29, 1992. Principle 1. Foods derived from genetic modification are regulated within the existing framework that applied to foods developed by traditional plant breeding. Obviously, the FDA decided not to create a special category for GMOs. For further information, contact James Mariansky, who headed the biotechnology department at the time. Basically, the government had taken a decision that it would not create new laws, that it felt there were already sufficient laws in place that had enough authority for the agencies to deal with new technologies. That means the White House asked the agency to write a policy where GMO should not be submitted to a specific regulatory regime? But it's not based on scientific data. It's a political decision? Yes, it was a political decision. It was a very broad decision that didn't apply to just foods. It applied to all products of biotechnology. Unbelievable. James Mariansky admits that GMO regulation was based on politics rather than science. How exactly did they justify their decision? Principle two. The components of food as a result of genetic modification of a plant will be the same as or substantially similar to substances commonly found in food. In other words, the FDA considers that a genetically modified plant is equivalent to its conventional counterpart. What they call the principle of substantial equivalence has been adopted around the world and it's at the heart of the debate between biotech supporters and GMO foes. How could the FDA decide that a GMO crop is the same as a convention plant? What we do know is that the genes that are being introduced currently, to date, using biotechnology, produce proteins that are very similar to proteins that we've consumed for many centuries. That's the FDA's official position on the matter, which was toppled by Jeffrey Smith, author of several books on GMOs. Michael Hansen, scientific expert for the Consumers Union of the United States, and writer Jeremy Rifkin, who was the first to denounce the principle of substantial equivalence. The reason why GM crops are here is based on a deception that occurred in the FDA. They said that these foods are not different. They use the word substantially equivalent. They use the word not meaningfully or uniformly different. And what that turned into was a, a terminology called generally recognized as safe, 
or grass. Typically, if something is to be considered generally recognized as safe, it needs lots of peer-reviewed published studies and an overwhelming consensus among the scientific community. With GM crops, they had neither. What FDA was saying was if you introduce a gene into a plant, that gene is DNA, and we've consumed DNA. We have a long history of consuming DNA, and we, we can establish that that is grass. We were trying to say that these things should be considered food additives. When you want to put a new coloring agent in a food, the tiniest bit of coloring agent or a, a preservative or some other tiny chemical, that's considered a food additive, and you have to go through all these procedures to show it's, uh, that it meets the criterion of reasonable certainty of no harm, but when you genetically engineer a food which can cause untold differences in that plant, they don't require anything. Here in Washington, if you, if you were to have an evening and go out and get a drink uh, at one of the local haunts where all the lobbyists hang out, uh, everybody would laugh about this. They all know this was a joke, this substantial equivalency. This was simply a way to paper over uh, the need for these companies, especially Monsanto, to move their products into the environment quickly with the least amount of government interference. And I should say uh, they were uh, very, very good at getting their uh, interest uh, expressed. I remember meetings that we had where the Monsanto scientists uh, met with the FDA scientists and they went through the kinds of modifications that they were making and how those were being done and basically what they were also saying to FDA is how will these products be regulated? I have never seen a situation where one company could have so much overwhelming influence at the highest levels of regulatory decision making as the example of Monsanto with its GM food policy in the government. Exceptional news footage actually shows George Bush Sr. visiting Monsanto's research facility nine years before Roundup Ready soybeans were first sold. What I'd like to uh, do today is show you some of the steps we go through when we're moving uh, genes from uh, one organism into another. And you'll actually be doing the, the very little manipulations we do in the laboratory where we take DNA, cut it apart, mix different pieces together, and then rejoin them, splice them back together. This tube contains DNA that was made from a bacterium. The DNA would look the same whether it was from a uh, plant or what an are we animal. Saying here? Oh, I see. And this will lead you to do what? To have a stronger plant or a plant that's that's uh, in this, resists uh, in this case, herbicide? In this case, it resists the herbicide. I see. We have a fabulous herbicide. This is a chemical that will... When George Bush Sr. toured the company's headquarters, he was Ronald Reagan's vice president. And deregulation was this Republican administration's watchword. The intention was to boost industry by eliminating what White House hardliners called bureaucratic hurdles, like health and environmental safety testing, which were Monsanto's key problems. We have before USDA right now a, a request to test this uh, for the first time in a, on a farm in, uh, in Illinois this year. And uh, get hallucinating about it, we'll lose another year. Yes, yeah. 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 And, and then uh, the experience goes out and nothing happens because you can't yeah. Yeah, and I would say, quite frankly, we have no complaint about the way USDA is handling it. Uh, they're going through an orderly process. They're making sure Very that as they deal with these new things, they do them properly. And uh, no, if we're waiting until September and we don't have our authorization, we may say something different. <laughs> Call me. We're in a direct business. <laughs> In 1988, when George Bush Sr. was elected President of the United States, Dan Quayle became the new Vice President. Four years later, he announced the American policy concerning GMOs, drafted just as Monsanto had wanted. We are taking this step as part of the President's Regulatory Relief Initiative, now in its second phase. The United States is already the world leader in biotechnology and we want to keep it that way. In 1991 alone, it was a $4 billion industry. It should reach at least $50 billion by the year 2000, as long as we resist the spread of unnecessary regulation. 
Do you think it, it was really a conspiracy? A conspiracy is a strong word. From a corporate standpoint, it was a brilliantly executed takeover. Early on, uh, a gentleman by the name of Michael Taylor became the deputy uh, administrator of the Food and Drug Administration right at the time that they were about to set out their policy. Who is Michael Taylor? On the internet, only a single image remains of the man who once wielded his power so discreetly. Today, he has a foundation called Resources for the Future. Hello, Marie Monique speaking. Hello, it's Mike Taylor. My questions are about your your role. I mean, when you uh, were working at the FDA, yeah? um, before hi being hired by the FDA, you worked as an attorney for Monsanto during seven years, didn't you? Well, I was a partner in a law firm of which Monsanto was a client. And uh -huh. I worked on some Monsanto matters, yes. Uh -huh. And apparently, if I understood well what I read, and the FDA created a new position for you, Deputy Commissioner for Policy? Well... Because there was a special need at that time uh, at the FDA because of the new GMOs? It, uh, had, it had nothing to do with GMOs. Ah. Nothing at all to do with GMOs. I wasn't the author of these policies, but that's just, that, that's very, that's just false. He moved over to the FDA in July of 1991. Up until that time, he was at a law firm called King & Spaulding. His personal clients included not only Monsanto, but the International Food Biotechnology Council. And he had drafted for them a proposal for how they would like to see genetically engineered foods regulated. And if you look at the proposal that was written for IFBC that was Michael Taylor's with the final one that was published, it looks very, very similar. So he, if he didn't write it, it looks like somebody took what he wrote and changed it slightly for the policy. Mr. Taylor was the um, uh, deputy commissioner at the time, and he provided the leadership um, for the project and served as the, the chief, uh, the sort of the lead uh, policy person in terms of uh, making sure that the project got done. So Monsanto played that game very well, both the political game and the uh, regulatory game. They played a key role in bovine growth hormone in getting that thing approved and also in how genetic engineering was dealt with. Michael Hansen has just mentioned bovine growth hormone. What's that? It's a transgenic hormone that's injected into cows, increasing dairy production by 20%. It would be an understatement to say that it had critics. The hormone threatens our health. Deadly poison. Manipulation. Called RBGH for a recombinant bovine growth hormone, Monsanto began selling it to dairy farmers in 1994 under the brand name Posilac. Posilac is the single most tested new product in history. You'll soon see the dramatic results Posilac can offer you. In 1985, Monsanto submitted Posilac to the FDA for market approval. The experts at the FDA's Center for Veterinary Medicine reviewed the studies that the company had carried out on experimental herds. At the FDA, the veterinarian in charge of reviewing the data was Richard Burroughs. In an interview, he stated that agency officials had suppressed and manipulated data. The data that they came in with lacked a lot of insight into the dairy industry. They didn't ask crucial questions about these diseases, and that is mastitis, which is infection of the mammary gland, and reproductive problems. 
So when the first data came in and that was missing, I said, um, all right, guys, you need to go back and get information. So that set it back probably two or three years. Did you warn the FDA about your concerns? They pretty much just sidetracked me. They pulled in, my boss pulled in other people that were closer to him, and I saw less and less of the data. Even the things I had asked for to be done, I didn't, like the mastitis studies, I never really got to see a lot of that because they figured, well, if you're in the way, we'll get you out of the way. So they sidetracked me. Eventually I was fired. One day I was escorted to the door and told that was it. I was, I was done. Have you been threatened? Yes, um, mainly by the lawyers for Monsanto, because when I was going for my appeal, they told my lawyer that if I went in and revealed any company secrets in my defense, that they would sue me. In the end, the FDA was forced to reinstate this conscientious veterinarian. He eventually resigned, disheartened. On the internet, there's also talk about files that were stolen from the FDA and sent to Dr. Samuel Epstein, who heads the Cancer Prevention Coalition. In 1990, Samuel Epstein published an article in The Milkweed, the standard for dairy reporting, edited by Pete Hardin. The scoop was based on the secret documents that the two men scrutinized. One morning, uh, I came in, I think in October of that year, I came into my office and found a great big box of documents. And um, the, it came from Washington, but no indication as to who sent it. This was a box of files of all Monsanto records which had been submitted to the FDA on the veterinary tests in the preceding six years or so. Well, this was great fun. Many of these documents are original documents. Uh, and as it says here, company confidential. It can, contains confidential information which not be, may not be reproduced, revealed to unauthorized persons, or sent outside the company without proper authorization. As an investigative journalist, that's the kind of stuff I like to report. Revealing this information made Monsanto and FDA very, very angry because what we were able to establish is that there were dramatic physiological changes in the animals that received the shot, the hormone shots, compared to their control group peers. For example, we see the ovaries of the cows receiving the synthetic hormone in the different treatment groups were, for the right ovaries, 34% larger, 42% larger, and 44% larger. Elsewhere in the stolen files, it shows how there were severe problems with the reproduction of these treated animals. The data is conclusive. We provided the data, the raw data, uh, and summary data, peer-reviewed data not done by us, to support the submission. Every health authority who has looked at bovine somatotropin has found that it is completely safe for consumers. For Monsanto, the hormone is not only safe, it is actually beneficial for consumers. Because the chemical composition of the milk is not altered as a result of Pozolac, the manufacturing and taste properties do not change. It's untrue or lie, whatever adjective you want to use. <laughs> um, it's a very different product. It's a very, very different product in many, many ways. First of all, um, as there's a high incidence of mastitis in the cows, there'll be pus in the milk. And then you'd find antibiotics to the, uh, given to the cows to uh, treat the mastitis. So a wide range of antibiotics would be in the milk. Apart from that, and very, very importantly, very substantial increases in levels of IGF-1 or insulin like growth factor 1. There have been a series of studies somewhere in the region of 60 relating increased levels of IGF-1 and breast, colon and prostate cancers. Absolutely incredible. 
Are there other countries that have approved RBGH? Apparently, the hormone was banned in Europe and Canada. Canada? That's strange because Health Canada usually models its decisions on the FDAs. RBGH, scandal at Health Canada. Monsanto accused of attempt to bribe Health Canada for RBGH. Margaret Hayden, I swear that the evidence I shall give in October 1998, three scientists from Health Canada testified before a Senate commission in order to stop the approval of the transgenic hormone. The scandal was made public by whistleblower Dr. Shiv Chopra. Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. My question to myself was, what truth am I going to tell the one I know or the what the minister is telling me to tell? And that was my uh, conflict. I would ask each one of you, have everyone, any one of you been uh, lobbied by Monsanto? Any one of you? Dr. Hayden. I did attend a meeting uh, back uh, approximately about, I believe, 1989-90, uh, and Monsanto representatives had met with uh, myself and my uh, supervisor, Dr. Drennan, and my director, Dr. Messier, and at that meeting, uh, an offer of one to two million dollars was made uh, by the company, and uh, I don't know uh, any more about what became of that, but uh, my director <coughs> indicated after the meeting that he was going to report it to his uh, superiors. How did Monsanto react? Well, Monsanto did not deny that they made the offer of one to two million dollars at this meeting. They later on tried to say, oh, this was an offer of research in Canada uh, to uh, do some more studies in cows in Canada or whatever. So anyway, that's what happened in Canada. The drug was not approved. So the European Parliament, based on what revelations in Canada, banned it forever. And then all of a sudden, we three, Margaret Hayden, Gerard Lambert, and I were dismissed for disobedience. And we fired. All three of us were fired, and those fights are now in courts. The United States Congress also opened an investigation at the request of RBGH opponents who opposed the ban on labeling milk as RBGH free. Interestingly enough, the investigation was never completed. Purchases of milk surpluses. Bovine growth hormone, BGH, is a test of consumer acceptance of genetic engineering. In the garbage. In the garbage. In the garbage. The cow hormone drug was simply the first major application of biotechnology to food production and Monsanto is a very powerful corporation with many many linkages to top-level persons in government uh, I think the prevailing ethic at the federal government was f f biotechnology is so important that we can't let a few little questions about cow safety or human safety get in the way. The reason the FDA approved it is it appeared to be that there was a lot of people that used to work at, had key positions that had worked for Monsanto, came over to the FDA and managed to get the FDA to approve it. It's revolving doors that move up. It's kind of like a double helix, it's a spiral. Revolving door? Yes, revolving door. The revolving door is not just in agriculture. It tends to be in many, many areas. Donald Rumsfeld was the CEO of Searle, which was a Monsanto subsidiary. The former U.S. trade ambassador, Mickey Cantor, ended up on Monsanto's board. Supreme Court Judge Clarence Thomas used to work for Monsanto. Monsanto revolving doors. The state of affairs in 1999 includes Linda Fisher moves from the Environmental Protection Agency to Monsanto, Michael Friedman from the FDA to Monsanto, Marsha Hale and Josh King from the White House to Monsanto, Margaret Miller from Monsanto to the FDA, William Ruckelshaus from the EPA to Monsanto, and let's not forget Michael Taylor, 
who went back and forth several times. Once your mission carried out by the FDA, you became Monsanto's vice president for public policy. Right. So there was no conflict of interest for you? No, the, the, no. And, and again, the rules are the rules, and I played within the rules. I think in terms of public acceptance, it, it's been one blunder after another. If you're trying to have a strategy for, yeah. for having the public understand and accept the new technology, having the first application of it be, uh, have, be related to milk, which we already have more than we need, it created, you know, uh, it helped create a climate of, of suspicion. suspicion. I think the idea that, that companies are not required in every case of a GMO to submit the product to FDA, such as is required in Europe, I think that from a public confidence, public acceptance standpoint, that's not a sufficient system. I personally have said that Congress should change the law. Congress should create a mandatory notification system that ensures that every product is looked at by FDA and that FDA makes a safety judgment about every product. That's some very compelling testimony. It seems that Michael Taylor has qualms about the policy he signed in 1992. What about the FDA's own scientists? Was there a consensus on the GMO regulations? FDA documents show they ignored GMO safety warnings from their own scientists, written by Steve Drucker. <laughs> Lawyer Stephen Drucker represents a coalition of nonprofit associations. He sued the FDA, forcing it to declassify its internal files on GMOs. We received over 44,000 pages from the FDA's own files, and they revealed that the FDA has been lying to the world since 1992, if not before. But they continue to lie. They are still lying. They claim that there is an overwhelming consensus in the scientific community that genetically engineered foods are as safe as their conventionally produced counterparts. And they claim that there has been sufficient data to back up this consensus. Both of those claims are blatant lies. There are several examples. For instance, Dr. Louis Preble of the FDA's microbiology group wrote, quote, there is a profound difference between the types of unexpected effects from traditional breeding and genetic engineering, unquote. Then Dr. Preble added in his memo that some of the aspects of genetic engineering may be more hazardous. The concern expressed by the FDA's various scientific experts was so clear and unmistakable that the FDA official whose job it was to track and summarize the scientist's input, Dr. Linda Call, wrote a memo to the FDA biotechnology coordinator, Dr. James Mariansky. According to the internal FDA's files, which have been declassified now, uh, there were many in-house critics, I mean, among the scientists of the FDA, uh, about uh, proposed policy. I have, for instance, a memorandum sent to you by Linda Carl. Right. She stated, the processes of genetic engineering and traditional breeding are different. Traditional breeding are different, and according to the technical experts in the agency... They lead to different risks. Different risks. The point was that we had many people with many different views. Uh, Linda Call, of course, ha wrote that in her memo, but in fact, when we finished the policy, all the scientists agreed with the policy. Now, FDA has, of course, looked at the use of genetic engineering and has no information that simply the use of the techniques creates products that differ in safety or quality. Even before the consistent warnings in the memos from the FDA's own scientists, the FDA had very clear warning because the very first genetically engineered food supplement that came to market in the United States caused a major epidemic. Do you remember what happened in 89 with uh, L-tryptophan? Uh, Do you remember? Yes. It was a bioengineered amino acid. We know very well what's amino acid and... Right that killed dozens of people and made hundreds and hundreds sick. 
It caused an epidemic of an unusual disease called EMS. Right. And how many, many people died? Right, but we have many... 37 and more than 1,000 people disabled. Do you remember? I do and remember. And you said, according to FDA administrative record, we do not yet know the cause of EMS, nor can we rule out the engineering of the organism. Did you say that, that I read? Yes. Amazing. James Mariansky can't rule out the possibility that it's the genetic manipulation itself that triggers unexpected side effects. But he did nothing. Have any independent scientists investigated this question, which is crucial for consumers? Arpad Pustai, world-renowned scientist, lost his job when he warned about GE Foods, 1998. Arpad Pustai worked for the Rowett Institute in Scotland. At the Ministry of Agriculture's request, he led a study on genetically modified potatoes with a budget of over 2 million euros and a staff of 30 researchers to prepare the arrival of GMOs in Great Britain. We were all enthusiastic about it. I was enthusiastic about it. The Ministry thought that if we did this study, looking at all aspects, uh, then it would be an endorsement of GM. And when they introduce it, they would say that uh, the foremost laboratory in uh, Europe, um, uh, nutritional laboratory, had uh, looked at them and they found them all right. Arpide pustai specializes in lectins. These proteins function as an insecticide protecting plants against aphids. Rowett scientists had created potatoes that were resistant to aphids and into which they introduced a snowdrop gene, which produces the lectin in question. Beforehand, they verified that in their naturally occurring state, lectins themselves do not pose a health risk. The genetically modified potatoes were tested on rats. It had a twofold effects. First, it started to uh, increase a, a proliferative response in the gut. And that you don't like, uh, because uh, this is uh, possibly, uh, I'm not saying that it is cancerous, but what it uh, does, it, it does, uh, it can have an adjuvant effect on, on any chemical, uh, uh, chemically in induced tumor. The other thing is the immune system was certainly in, uh, got into high gear. And that was, uh, we don't know, whether it's good or bad, or, but it certainly did recognize the GM potatoes as, as alien. And we were convinced that uh, this insertion is causing the problem and not the transgene. As I said, the transgene, when we uh, did it in isolation, even at 800-fold concentration didn't do any harm. It uh, was a very important point because the American FDA is, uh, 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 is going on by uh, about a neutral technology. And what we did say and what we did publish was uh, actually corroborated, confirmed that it was not the, uh, the transgene which was the problem, but it was the technology. While the first shipments of genetically modified soybeans were arriving in Great Britain, Arpad Pustai's superiors authorized him to be interviewed by the BBC. As a scientist actively working on the field, uh, I find that uh, it's very, very unfair to use uh, our fellow citizens as uh, guinea pigs. They will never forgive me for that. Monsanto did see the importance of, uh, of our findings. Don't worry about it. Even before uh, the, the broadcast went out, uh, the, the, they already knew uh, because the Scottish Crop Research Institute did get a lot of money from Monsanto. And they were not uh, slow to understand the implications. The day after the interview's broadcast, Arpad Pustai was fired and the research team dismantled. 
Dr. Stanley Ewan was in charge of evaluating the impact of GM potatoes on the rat's internal organs. He no longer has any illusions about scientific independence. I was extremely, well, angry and very, very concerned. I just, it's like your whole world is disappearing under your feet. What's going on? But you see, they start to discredit Stanley as well. It's not just our part, me. Stanley was made to retire and he was discredited at the university. As well? Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes. yes. It was um, very hard indeed. Monday, it was wonderful work. Tuesday, it was rubbish. Uh, I had one or two ideas of what was happening, but a very imprecise idea until uh, eight years ago, almost exactly, I was at a, a dinner dance. And next to me at the top table was someone from the road called Dutteroy, who uh, happened to say, I said, isn't it awful what's happening to our pad? Yes, he said, and did you, did you not know that there were not one, but two phone calls from Downing Street to the director? And then, of course, I saw clearly what was happening, that this was something uh, sort of supranational, if you like, some pressure being put on Tony Blair's office to stop this work because it was perceived by the Americans to be harming their um, industrial base, uh, the biotech industry, in other words. <laughs> The Arpad Pustai scandal triggered a massive rejection of GMOs in Great Britain, led by Greenpeace. A year later, Robert Shapiro, Monsanto's CEO at the time, agreed to participate in a teleconference organized by the environmental organization. This is the only existing video footage of the former CEO. He was responsible for moving the company into the biotechnology era with its new slogan, Food, Health and Hope. Monsanto made huge efforts to push its products in every direction with the full support of multinational food manufacturers, retailers, communications firms, regulators, even governments. You behave not as a company offering life and hope, but as bullies trying to force your products on us. Um, I, 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 sir, if I'm a bully, I don't feel that I'm a very successful bully. I want to start by emphasizing that biotechnology is, is a tool. Biotechnology in itself is neither good nor bad. It can be used well or it can be used badly. The products that are on the market have been reviewed uh, through the regulatory processes that society has established in order to assure not only safety but the environmental safety uh, of, of uh, the products themselves. After 10 years on the market, Roundup Ready soybeans account for 90% of all the soybeans grown in the U.S. In fact, 70% of the food in American stores contains bioengineered elements. Unlike Europe, consumers cannot make an informed decision because GM labeling is forbidden a direct consequence of the principle of substantial equivalence. You know, I've got a soybean in my hand here, and I can eat this soybean. It's very safe, very safe. I think FDA is confident that the soybean, in terms of food safety, is as safe as other varieties of soybean. How is the FDA confident about that? It's based on all the data that that the company provided to FDA that was reviewed by FDA scientists. And so it's, it's, it's not in the company's interest to try to design a study in some way that would mask results. How can James Mariansky be so sure? If I type in Monsanto falsified scientific studies, I get 174,000 hits. Among them, a report from the EPA of the United States. Monsanto accused of falsifying studies concerning the carcinogenicity of dioxin.
The story began in nitro, in a Monsanto factory that produced a powerful herbicide called 245T. In 1949, an explosion in the factory provoked unexpected side effects. 228 workers developed an extremely disfiguring illness called chloracne. It's caused by dioxin, which is a highly toxic byproduct of 245T. Four five t was the main ingredient in Agent Orange, the defoliant used by the U.S. Army during the Vietnam War. During the war, 40 million liters of Agent Orange, containing 400 kilograms of pure dioxin, were sprayed on trees in southern Vietnam. Three million people were contaminated, including thousands of American soldiers. Even some 40 years after the end of the war, dioxin continues to claim more victims. We know today that this poison provokes cancer and serious genetic malfunctions. In 1978, while American Vietnam veterans were suing the makers of Agent Orange, Monsanto sponsored studies on the long-term effects of dioxin. The company paid scientists to compare the health of workers who had been exposed during the nitro plant's accident 30 years prior to the health of non-exposed workers. There are two experts on the subject. William Sanjur, who led the Toxic Waste Division of the Environmental Protection Agency, and Gerson Smoger, a lawyer who represents Vietnam veterans. In 1990, uh, Dr. Kate Jenkins, uh, a colleague of mine at EPA, wrote a memorandum pointing out that allegations had been made that those studies, uh, some of those studies that Monsanto had conducted were flawed and if they were done correctly, would have reached just the opposite result of that Monsanto had. The Monsanto studies showed that dioxin was not a human carcinogen. Well, that means they had the data first, and then they manipulated how they were gonna look at that data to come up with the conclusion they want. It's absolutely, you never do a study that way, never and they did it absolutely wrong, they, and they achieved what they wanted. And it would, came out later that there were people that had cancer that in one of those two studies were listed as being exposed to dioxin, and the same five people in another study were listed as not being exposed. When you put all these cancers into the unexposed, then it looked like the unexposed people were getting as much cancer as the exposed, and they said, but there's no difference. See, they're the same. So then thousands and thousands of veterans were, were disallowed benefits uh, because of exposure to Agent Orange. So all policy was affected by those studies for seven to nine years in this country. Being a good scientist and a good EPA employee, uh, and someone, by the way, who was quite fearless, Kate Jenkins wrote a memorandum to the EPA Science Advisory Board asking them to review these two studies to see if they were correctly done. The fact is, there was no investigation of Monsanto. It didn't exist. Nobody investigated those, uh, those st studies. Nobody, period. What they investigated was Kate Jenkins, the whistleblower. They made her life a hell. They harassed her. They changed her jobs. They persecuted the poor woman. If you think of Monsanto today, they are telling that their GMOs, for instance, are sound and safe. Uh, do you trust the company? I wouldn't believe company? a word that company says, nothing. I might trust some independent source who investigated their claims, uh -huh. depending on who that independent source was and how good they are and how independent they are. Precisely. In order to prove the safety of Roundup Ready soybeans, Monsanto carried out a study which was published in 1996 in a well-respected scientific journal. 
The study was supposed to assess the effects of GM soybeans on animal health, specifically on rats. This study was thoroughly reviewed by both a Danish scientist, now deceased, and the Norwegian specialist, Ian Prime. I'm afraid to say, uh, value this study very poorly indeed. It's very disappointing, very disappointing. Um, especially because this paper sort of served as a basis for the whole um, uh, principle of, of, of uh, substantial equivalence. I can just cite, which is again a bit surprising, although the animal feeding studies provide some reassurance that no major changes occurred. Now, some reassurance, now that's good enough. I want 100% reassurance, not just some, some reassurance. They talk, for example, about the, um, on page 723, except for the darker brown color, livers appeared normal at necropsy. I mean, the, you, you, you can't do that without looking inside. You, you, you have to look at the content in, in, inside the liver, taking sections, showing under the microscope that there is no, no difference. They've used, for example, older, older rats. Obviously, again, if you want to avoid any problems, okay, use an adult. But uh, if you want to, to see if, if uh, any changes are evident, then you should use younger individuals, of course. In some ways, you can say it's bad science because um, a lot of the data that they should have shown isn't shown. But did you try, for instance, to get access to the raw data? I didn't. A colleague of mine did and spent quite a frustrating length of time going through different uh, offices and, 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 and so on. But finally, the answer, was, uh, the, the, the answer was no. If there was nothing to hide, then there should be no, no problem. You be, should be willing to, to distribute your, your material for anybody to do work on. And when, it's, when, when you keep it, keep it tight, then you suspect that there's, why, why is this the case? One thing is sure, thanks to this limited study, Monsanto's GMOs have inundated the world, principally in North and South America, Asia and Australia. After only 10 years, transgenic crops now cover 250 million acres. 70% are Roundup resistant, and 30% have been genetically modified to produce an insecticide called BT. Since 2001, the company has published a yearly document titled The Pledge Report, a kind of ethics statement in which Monsanto tries to justify its business practices. At the heart of the opposition to GMOs is the subject of patents. This is what Monsanto calls their intellectual property, which are supposed to protect their investment. In North America, every farmer who buys bioengineered seeds must sign a technology agreement in which the farmer promises to respect the company's patent on the modified gene. Biotech crops are protected by U.S. patent law and so I may not in any way save seed to uh, replant uh, the following year. It's uh, something that uh, is a protection for, the, for Monsanto, for biotech companies, because they literally invest millions and millions of dollars uh, to produce this new technology. And how can Monsanto know that someone, for instance, replant harvested seeds? I, I'm not sure how they, how to answer that. No, how they would how they would know if someone replanted seed. That's a good question for Monsanto. <laughs> the question is so touchy that Monsanto prefers to circumvent it by making glorious promises. In cases of unintended appearance of our proprietary varieties on a farmer's field, we will surely work to resolve the matter to the satisfaction of both the farmer and Monsanto. The reality seems much less idyllic. The Center for Food Safety in Washington, D.C. published a study on farmers sued by Monsanto for having not respected its seed patents. 
It found at least 100 lawsuits and many bankruptcies. Among the victims, Troy Rush, an Indiana farmer. Our story starts back in 1999. A gentleman, and I use that term loosely, uh, showed up at my mother and father's farm and uh, he claimed to be uh, a private investigator hired by Monsanto. And uh, he was uh, out investigating uh, farmers saving their own seed uh, and uh, asked us, uh, he'd come right out and ask us if we'd saved their seed. And uh, we told him no, we had not, and um, offered up our herbicide purchases and seed purchases. Uh, all the receipts and everything. Um, told him where everything was purchased so he could go check it out for himself. Um, he, uh, he declined that, uh, that offer. And um, what occurred is then they, they sued us. Monsanto filed a lawsuit against myself, uh, my father, and my two brothers. And uh, Monsanto presented us with uh, documents that they claimed were uh, samples taken from our farms. To obtain those samples, Monsanto had to have trespassed upon our land without our permission and stole those samples. That year, I recall we had uh, 492 acres of Roundup Ready soybeans. Um, and they were, they were growing under contract for a company for seed. Um, and the contract was very specific. It spelled out the specific fields. So it wasn't a problem in isolating those fields. Um, everybody knew it. And why did you settle out of court with, with Monsanto? Well, after two and a half years of this, uh, the family was just just destroyed. Um, uh, the stress involved in this, I mean, they're in essence threatening five generations of work. And um, if they were to prevail in something like this, it's all gone. They take it all away. They take it all away. Good morning. Morning, sir. How, How are you this morning, Troy? I'm well. How are you, David? Still surviving? Good. <laughs> Troy Rausch and David Runyon grow conventional soybeans. They have been victims of the so-called gene police. Created by Monsanto to enforce its law in the fields, the gene police so fear in rural America, where farmers denounce the totalitarian methods used in a GMO-dominated world. I have some pictures here for you, Troy, I'd like for you to look at. Okay. Here's what I have done, Troy, to uh, help prevent re-entry on my farm. Of anyone coming onto my farm. <laughs> Summer, it was in July of 2003, and they came, it was the latter part of July, they came to my house, it was uh, like 7 p.m. Who came? Uh, Monsanto employees. And they presented me with a uh, business card. And uh, they asked me a few questions about the kind of soybeans I plant, the kind of corn I plant, uh, where I market my crops, and so I said, okay, that's the end of the conversation. Yeah, patents have changed. They've changed everything. It revolves with a, with, with a relationship of trust with neighbors. That is gone. Uh, my myself, I probably only have two farmers that I talk to that are close to me. Are they really afraid, the farmers? Of course they're afraid. You can't defend yourself against these people. They've created a little industry that, that serves no other purpose than to wreck farmers' lives. Um, of course they're afraid. Does it mean that you're afraid, for instance, that the neighbor can snitch on you? Yes. Yes? Yeah. Yes. All you have to do is, is dial 1-800. Dial 1-800 Monsanto. Or no, I'm sorry, 1-800 Roundup. I remember encouraging farmers to uh, call this, this toll-free number and turn their neighbor in. And why does Monsanto do that? Well, the reason they do it is control. Seeds? Yeah. They want to control the seed. They want to own life. I mean, this is the building blocks of food we're talking about. They, they are in the process of owning food, all food. Between 1995 and 2005, Monsanto acquired over 50 seed companies throughout the world. These companies produce corn, cotton, wheat, and soybean, and also seeds for tomatoes, potatoes, and sorghum. Everywhere, people worry about Monsanto's monopoly, 
which in the long term threatens to wipe out all non-transgenic varieties. Monsanto doesn't agree and speaks only about the benefits of biotechnology, especially in developing countries like India. Our products provide significant economic benefits to both large and small growers. In many cases, farmers are able to grow higher quality and better yielding crops. India is the world's third largest cotton producer. In 1999, Monsanto acquired Mahiko, the country's leading seed company. Two years later, the Indian government authorized the sale of BT cotton under the brand name Balgard. It is genetically modified to produce an insecticide which repels ballworms, a cotton parasite. <laughs> Since 2001, Kiran Sakari and Abdul Gayam have been closely following the transgenic cotton grown by small farmers in the Warangal district. Every year, the two agronomists publish a report comparing bioengineered cotton with conventional cotton in terms of yields and production costs. In 2006, the harvest was ravaged by a disease that affects transgenic cotton. This is a Bolgard uh, field. Uh, and we can see some of the rhizoctonia affected plants. You see, if you remove the bark of a healthy plant, it, will, it won't be like this, like threads. See, it's a classic example of rhizoctonia infestation. The farmers, they have said they have never seen that. And uh, when we were doing our study from 2001, we have noted this disease on very few samples in the BT cotton only. And as the time passed, the spread was seen more and more in the BT fields as well as some non-BT fields also. But I personally feel that there might be some interaction, undesirable interaction between the host plant where the gene was introduced and the gene which is carrying the BT. And that has introduced the weakness in the plant to not to resist this rhizoctonia. I have seen the, the website of the uh, Michael Monsanto. BT cotton reduces 78 percent of the pesticide reduction, um, and pesticide consumption, and it gives to 30 percent better yields. But it's uh, it's an utter flop. After 70, 90 days, you, invariably you have to spray for uh, bollworms even on the BT cotton. How do you explain that so many farmers are buying BT seeds? See, the, presently the option is very, very na is getting narrower and narrower to the farmer. During the current season, it, even farmer wanted to go for non-BT. There was no non-BT hybrid seed available in the market. Today in India, Monsanto controls nearly all of the cottonseed market forcing the locals to buy its seeds at prices four times higher than conventional varieties. Small farmers must turn to money lenders who charge high interest rates. If the harvest is poor, it means bankruptcy, a vicious circle which is decimating Indian villages. Tragedies like the one we've just witnessed occur three times a day in the Vidharba region, where BT cotton was introduced in 2005. Of course, cotton farmers committing suicide is not new in India, but the GM crops are causing it to skyrocket. However, in this battle that pits David against Goliath, 
few dare to publicly denounce this international scandal. This is Vidarbha's rice growing belt. So if you see the minimum suicides are there. But this is the cotton growing area. The result of the BT cotton is the first year 600 suicides from June 2005 to 2006. Second year, still today, within six months, 680 suicides. So it's a disaster. It's a complete disaster, yes. All these technologies, either it is GM or biotechnology, they're actually making the farmers completely dependent on the market because not only that you, you have to pay more for the seed procurement but you you have to fertilize it. and there the, this very claim that no spraying is required no pesticide is required is also false when monsanto claims in advertising that gm crops are adapted for small farmers what do you think it's our experience so that it is completely false it's completely false it's a lie On this day in December of 2006, a revolt was brewing in the largest cotton market in the state of Maharashtra. Three days later, riots broke out and dozens of small farmers, including Kishore Tiwari, were arrested. <laughs> Uh, 60,000 rupees a day. Mm -hmm. 50,000 rupees a day. Yeah. 20,000 rupees a day. 50,000 rupees a day. 15,000 rupees a day. 15,000 rupees a day. They don't want to cook for the beauty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Seeds of Suicide is the title of a book by physicist Vandana Shiva. She won the alternative Nobel Prize and heads the Navdana organization, which aims to conserve traditional seeds. In the beginning, Vandana Shiva's battle was against the first Green Revolution, which brought industrial agriculture to India in the 1960s. Today, she denounces what she calls the second Green Revolution, that of GMOs protected by patents. The difference is that the first Green Revolution was public sector driven. It was driven by government agencies. The government agencies controlled the research. In the case of the second Green Revolution, it is driven by Monsanto. It is a Monsanto-driven revolution. The second big difference is that the first Green Revolution did have a hidden objective of selling more chemicals. But its first objective was providing food. It was food security. And yes, they grew less pulses, they grew less oil seeds, but they did grow more rice and wheat, it fed people. The second Green Revolution has nothing to do with food security. It's not about food security. It is about returns to Monsanto's profits. That's all it is about. They've always said genetic engineering is the way to get to patenting, but patenting is the real aim. If you look at Monsanto's research agenda, they are testing at this point something like 20 crops with BT genes in them. There's nothing they're leaving untouched. The mustard, the okra, the brinjal, the rice, um, the cauliflower. Once they have established the norm that seed can be owned as their property, royalties can be collected, we will depend on them for every seed we grow, of every crop we grow. If they control seed, they control food, they know it. It's strategic. It's more powerful than bombs. It's more powerful than guns. This is the best way to control the populations of the world. Monsanto responds to Ms. Shiva's persuasive argument by brandishing its pledge, integrity, dialogue, transparency, and sharing. 
We want to participate constructively in the process by which societies around the world try to develop good answers to those questions. Are the products going to be safe for the environment? How are they going to affect biodiversity? How are they going to affect other plants and insects and birds? What about outcrossing of genes? What happens if, if genes do outcross into wild species? To me, that means, among other things, listening carefully and respectfully to all points of view. Despite Robert Shapiro's placid demeanor, he has just touched on a subject that greatly troubles GMO opponents, transgenic contamination, which Monsanto prefers to call an adventitious presence that's part of the natural order. According to a study led by Berkeley professor Dr. Ignacio Chapella, GMOs have already contaminated Mexican corn. But when the scientific journal Nature published the study's findings, it triggered a violent controversy. I had been working for 15 years with indigenous communities in Oaxaca, in Mexico, and they had been developing the capacity to analyze their environment themselves. One of my students went to try and train people to detect transgenics. We brought with ourselves a positive control that was a can of corn from the US that we knew was transgenic. And we were looking for a negative control. And we thought the best negative control is going to be corn from the local places. Because we all believe that was the cleanest, the most um, uh, well-preserved source of corn in the world. So the surprise came when we looked at these samples and we discovered that the samples that we all believed would be non-transgenic had already transgenic DNA within them. It was a very big surprise for us to discover that this these uh, land races of corn that were kept by people locally and supposedly maintained over 10,000 years had already been reached by transgenic contamination, mostly from the U.S. Mexico is the center of origin for corn. More than 150 local corn varieties can be found in just the southern region of Oaxaca. This extensive biodiversity is a treasure, the world's genetic reservoir of corn. Millions of Mexican farmers have maintained it for thousands of years. This corn is for the family? Yes, only for the family. We use it to make tortillas. This year is a good size, so we'll save it as seed for next year's planting. You don't buy your seeds? No. You exchange them? Yes, it's our ancient barter system. To preserve its corn's diversity, Mexico has banned genetically modified crops. However, due to the NAFTA free trade agreement it signed with the United States and Canada, Mexico cannot stop the massive importation of American corn, 40% of which is genetically modified. This industrial corn, as it's called in Mexico, is highly subsidized by the U.S. government. So on local markets, it costs half as much as traditional Mexican corn. Do you always make your tortillas with local corn? Yes. It's natural and has a better yield. Also, it's more nourishing because it comes from pure soil. That's blue corn. In the past, my ancestors only planted this kind of corn. Today, we maintain it as well. It existed before the Spanish conquest. Yes. There's another kind of conquest. What's the new conquest? 
It's the transgenic conquest that wants to destroy everything by making local corn disappear so that their industrial corn can dominate. If they succeed, we'll be dependent on multinationals. We'll be forced to buy the fertilizer and insecticides they sell because without them, their corn won't grow. Whereas the local corn grows very well without fertilizer or herbicide. Look at it. It's very beautiful. Ignacio Chapella's article provoked a violent reaction in Mexico. Since then, the National Ecology Institute has confirmed the contamination of Mexican corn. Roundup Ready and BT genes have been found in corn from five regions of the country. What would happen if bioengineered corn crossed with traditional land races? Dr. Alberas Buya led a study using a local flower. She inserted the same gene in several specimens and then observed their growth. We observed that two plants, strictly identical from a genetic point of view, in other words, they both have the same genome, the same chromosomes and the same transgene. The only difference is that the transgene is located in different places. And well, once they grew, these plants presented a phenotype. That is to say, flower shapes that were very different. Some have flowers that are identical to their natural counterparts, like here, four petals with four sepals. But others have abnormal flowers with abnormal hair or strange petals. In addition, some are completely monstrous. The only difference in all of these plants is the location of the transgene, which was inserted randomly. Why is that worrisome? In Mexico, once the transgenic corn seeds have been released into the environment, it's very likely that the transgenes will insert themselves into the genomes of the local Mexican varieties. It's an unavoidable phenomenon, because corn plants cross naturally by wind-blown pollen. Given that, we fear that the genetic resources of traditional corn will be uncontrollably affected. Good morning. We invite you to attend a meeting about the new diseases which are infecting our corn because of transgenic contamination. Aldo heads an organization of indigenous people. For two years, he's been leading an information campaign in Oaxaca communities, where Elena Alberas fears have already been confirmed in the fields. I'm going to show you some photos of some corn plants that we took in our region of Sierra Juarez. We'd like to know if you have already seen this type of plant in your community. You can see that some very strange things are going on. This plant, for example, has a branch here and another one there. Normally, a corn plant is not like that. There is always only one ear per leaf. But look here. There are three ears coming out of the same leaf. They are really monsters. We sent a plant sample to a biotech lab to see if maybe it contained genetically modified genes. Unfortunately, the test came out positive. Usually, we see these types of plants along the roadside or in people's yards. It's possible that people buy corn in the shop and they drop some kernels while walking. Some kernels germinate. This is how traditional corn became contaminated. From what you've said, if we don't manage to stop their spread in our fields, 
Soon we'll be forced to buy our corn seed because our own won't work anymore. That's very troubling. What should we do? First of all, if you find a strange plant, you should immediately remove its stamen, because that's where its pollen comes from. In any case, you must be very vigilant in monitoring your plants. Don't you think it's Monsanto's strategy, what they couldn't achieve legally, they are trying to force through contamination? Yes, we end up wondering if the contamination wasn't intentional. If the center of origin of corn becomes contaminated, the rest of the planet could follow. Contamination only benefits multinationals like Monsanto. How did Monsanto react to Ignacia Chapella's study on Mexican corn contamination? Monsanto's Dirty Tricks campaign against fired Berkeley professor Ignacio Chapella. An article by Jonathan Matthews, who heads GM Watch, a GMO information service based in southern England. According to Jonathan Matthews, Ignacio Chapella was a victim of a campaign launched on Ag Bio World, a pro-GMO internet site. On the eve of the article's publication in Nature, a certain Mary Murphy posted an email that Ag Bio World distributed to thousands of scientists around the world. She wrote, Activists will certainly run wild with news that Mexican corn has been contaminated by genes from GM corn. The very next day, a certain Andorra Smetacek posted a second email. Activist first, scientist second. It's totally a smear campaign, and this is what happens over the first couple of days. You get Murphy and Smetacek coming in, then others come in, and they say, we have to campaign on this. We have to inundate nature. We have to go to the editor of the journal, and we have to say this research isn't valid. Smetacek and Murphy, we'd, we'd been tracking them for some time and trying to work out who they were. In the case of Smetacek, we could look at the technical headers on the email. It says received from, and then we've got an internet protocol address. If we go off to a website registration site. Now all we have to do is just to copy that IP address. Organization name, Monsanto Company, and based in St. Louis. Then Mary Murphy left behind um, details that um, it enabled us to, to track who she was. So if, if we look Look here at the information that appeared, posted by Mary Murphy, and then we get the IP address bw6.bivwood.com. When we found that that was the original name of a PR agency called the Bivings Group, we quickly found out that on their client list was Monsanto, that this was an internet PR firm for Monsanto. That means fake scientists what are dirty tricks? Yeah, no, no, we're talking very dirty tricks here. Yeah, I mean, there, 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 there's no ethics at all in, in, in what's going on here. It shows an organization that is determined to push its products into countries around the world, and it's determined to destroy the reputation of anybody who stands in their way. Jonathan Matthews' accusations were covered in the British press, but Monsanto chose to ignore them. As it continues its unrelenting rise, the company defends its vision of a transgenic world that will resolve the problems of famine and the environment in perfect harmony. Practical experience clearly demonstrates that the coexistence of biotech, conventional, and organic systems is not only possible, but is peacefully occurring around the world. I see trees of green. Imagine a world that preserves the nature, the air, 
os rios, onde a gente possa produzir mais com menos agrotóxicos, sem desmatar as florestas. Você pensa num mundo com transgênicos. Uma iniciativa Monsanto com o apoio da Associação Brasileira de Nutrologia. A transgenic world already exists in South America, where 100 million acres of Roundup Ready soybeans were planted in 2007. Their conquest started 10 years ago in Argentina, the only country to have officially authorized transgenic crops. Since then, GMOs have mysteriously spread to neighboring countries like Brazil and Paraguay seen here. In 2005, Paraguay finally legalized these smuggled crops to save their soybean exports to Europe, where labeling GMOs is obligatory. In reality, for the Ministry of Agriculture, the deed had already been done. We had to authorize GMO seeds because they had already entered our country in a, let's say, unorthodox way. Do you know how transgenic seeds entered the country? Through the black market or smuggling? We don't speak, we don't speak about the black market, but about the blank sack, because these are the seed sacks that have no official markings. Did Monsanto play a role in this seed contraband? It is possible that the company, let's say, promoted its varieties and its seeds, and as I told you, the government had to react after the fact to authorize what was already a reality. Whatever the origin, contraband has been profitable for Monsanto. As soon as the crops were legalized, the company obtained the right to collect royalties on each ton of soybeans the country produced. Just like in Brazil. Since then, there has been no let-up in Paraguay's deforestation and the expulsion of many small farmers who refuse to relinquish their small plots of land. Jorge Galeano leads a small farmers organization which is fighting against the progression of what he calls the green desert. What we have here is an example of a GM extension of soybeans. In fact, it's a monocrop that destroys everything in its path. Before here, there were fields containing everything that a family needed to live, plants, trees, manioc, corn. Do you think that the GM crop can coexist with the crops of the small farmers? No, we are sure it can't. There are two incompatible models that can't coexist. It's a silent war that eliminates communities and families of small farmers. In addition, it destroys the biodiversity of the countryside. It brings death, poverty, and illness, as well as the destruction of the natural resources that help us live. Today, Roundup is sprayed all over Paraguay by plane or mechanical spreaders driven by unprotected farm workers. The herbicide is sprayed right up to people's front doors or near the subsistence crops of small farmers. Every year, crops are destroyed and thousands of people contaminated. Like this family, which is surrounded by Monsanto's GMOs. The parents are worried about their son Pedro because every day he has to cross the soybean fields to sell his mother's homemade corn tortillas. <laughs> How long has he had that? It started 15 days ago. It started on his foot and then it spread. That's how it starts. Mm. 
Does he have a headache? Is he eating? Very little. Today he didn't want to eat what I prepared for him. He only drank a little fruit juice. And his brother? He eats better, but it's difficult. That's the way we live. Recently, we lost 60 ducks and geese. They took a few steps, and then they fell down, dead as doornails. They spray deadly herbicide over there. And when it rains, the water streams down here, and since ducks live in water, that's the result. In Paraguay, 70% of the farmland is owned by only 2% of the population. With GMOs, the concentration is increasing. Three quarters of the soybean producers are foreigners staking claims for this new green gold. The ban on animal-based feed after the mad cow epidemic and the recent biofuel craze have caused soy prices to soar, triggering a rush to round up ready crops. According to the last census in Paraguay, each year 100,000 people leave rural areas to live in urban slums. An estimated 70% flee Monsanto's genetically modified soybeans, which are destined to feed Europe's chickens, cows, and pigs. We are going to talk about the production model of GM soybeans promoted by Monsanto. It's a true multinational company. It's everywhere in the world. Its objective is to control all of the world's food production through farmerless farming. The result is that Monsanto is depriving us of our food sovereignty of our ability to feed ourselves without depending on anyone else. That is why we say that we must fight for our independence, for our land. We must defend our communities, our families, and our country. In my case, my family lives in the city, but I don't want to go there. In the city, you have to buy everything, even food. Here, whatever we grow is ours. We can eat whatever we want, but in the city, you can't. If you don't have money, you have to search for food in garbage cans. I'd like to add that these families struggle to survive, touches all of us. In 2007, Monsanto employed 18,000 workers in 50 countries. In 2007, its stock prices continue to rise and its profits have reached a billion dollars. Its shareholders include not only pension funds and banks, but also hundreds of thousands of small investors. Chris Horner. Uh, hello, Christopher Horner. I'm Marie-Monique Robin from France. Yeah, we appreciate your persistence in, uh, in asking, but, uh, you know, we've had several conversations internally about this and uh, have not changed our position, so there's no reason for us to participate. Our suspicion is that it would not be positive. Um, so, you know, 